all nice and tight and cozy? Good. Uh, a few things. First of all, if you have not figured out where the worship guides are at the front and still need one, raise your hand and Ron will bring you one. If you did not get, or Bonnie, if you did not get a worship guide, Phil needs one up here at the front. They are on the little tables when you come in the doors on either side, just so you know for the future. Another thing you might need to know for the future is, for those of you who prefer to have a hymnal, they will be on the small table in the back, kind of near the coffee community area. So you can grab one of those. Um, I, won't, I, I can hand them out each week if I need to. I don't mind serving you in that way. But they will be back on that small table in case I happen to forget or be doing something else. One other thing that you need for this morning is a small communion set. For those of you who did not get one of those on your way in the door, probably the same people who didn't get a worship guide, if you'll just hold your hand up and those will be brought to you as well. Those of you who are about to be online with us, um, you will also need uh, the elements if you'd like to participate in that with us. One, yeah, he's working on it. He just got it. Uh, one other thing to make note of if you are standing in front of this camera during the time of welcome, you will be seen on the camera during the time of welcome, which is fine. And her. Oh, and her, which is fine. So don't tell secrets in front of the camera. Um, we are going to have our time of welcome that we started, our time of welcoming where we say to each other, you are welcome here. And we respond, you are welcome here. Our UBC passing of the Peace. So let's let's do that now. We'll conclude. You'll know it's time to start singing when you hear the music. Y'all are welcome. <laughs> Thank you. 
call to worship and prayer. The word has come for us from God. Who promises to shelter us under the wings of the hope and grace. The word has come to us from Jesus. Who encourages us to remember the good news we have received. The word flows to us from the Spirit. Who reminds us to place our hope and trust in God. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together today and help us to realize the encouragement we give each other simply by being here. We ask your blessings on us as we continue individually and collectively to try to do your will uh, in this time and place particularly as members of UBC, we ask your blessings on our efforts to bring your kingdom to our community. Forgive us where we fail, and give us the strength, and wisdom, and encouragement, and, and the rededication to your mission in this time and place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So good to see all of you together. I don't know about you, but I just love the togetherness of this place um, and just how we can all be in the same place together and feel like we're together. It's a different feel from the sanctuary. We'll enjoy it while we can. It is both a privilege and a sadness this morning um, for me to lead this time of blessing and sending for Billy King. Uh, for the last couple of years, Billy um, and Karen was with us for a while, and we enjoyed her beautiful spirit and presence as well. Um, but Billy has been not just an attender here, but an important part of our community, from preaching uh, when he's been needed, to teaching Bible studies, and reaching out, and just being the presence of Christ here in this community. So um, it is with sadness that we know that you're leaving soon, um, but we don't just send you away uh, empty because we believe that God continues to use you and will find new and amazing ways to use you. If you want to come up, you're welcome to say something, um, just to tell us about what's going on. Um, and if you get emotional, it's okay. I got you. Okay. Um, there are a lot of philosophies out there that uh, I hear very popular things that you know, eh, just don't sound right to me. For instance, uh, everything happens for a reason. I want you to know there is no reason for ALS. And you just deal with it, okay? Yep. And we did. Uh, and I don't believe that everything works out the way it's supposed to. That was true. I wouldn't be standing here by myself. That said, I do believe that in all things, God is at work for good. I knew that it was the right thing for us to move to this area, to be near Michael and Kate and the girls. I had no way of knowing that God was already preparing a place for me to land where I would be welcomed and where I would be loved, and where I would have an opportunity to use my gifts. <coughs> I cannot tell you how blessed and how thankful I am for this church. And all I can say is I pray that God open some opportunities like this where I am moving. I'll be moving again to be with Michael and Kate and Clara and me. And I'm excited about that but I am not the least bit excited about leaving you. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Blessing. Billy, if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask you to stand in the middle, kind of behind the camera there, and let anybody who's able and wants to, to come lay hands on him as we send him on. Um, for those of you who are farther away and you don't feel comfortable doing that, just stretch out your hands toward him uh, and offer your blessing. So those of you who are able, please get up and surround him. Or you can also reach out and touch the, the hand of somebody who's touching him and that way it all goes to the same place. Can we touch the I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious God, you have given us such a gift in Billy and in Karen when she was with us, uh, and in both of their presence and the love that they brought to this community, the, the warmth and the many gifts and talents they've shared with us. And God, those have not been in vain. You have used uh, both of them, and especially Billy in these last few months, um, because of and despite of the things that he has been through and experienced. And God, we send him with heavy hearts because he will be missed here. His presence and his family's presence uh, will leave a hole among us that will be hard to fill. And yet we can send him with excitement and with joy, just like this church has done so many times before, sending people on to different places. It's not just the hole that's left behind, but it is the warmth and the love and the presence of Christ that this congregation uh, does so well, that goes with him and will bless somebody else. God, he has so many talents, so many ways that he will be able to serve you in the future. You are in no way finished working with him and working in him. And so as we go, as he goes, we pray. 
that you would give him clarity, that you would give him confidence that you have prepared a place for him just like you did when you came here, that he would find that place and find ways to spread his wings in a new setting. And for all of us who are here behind, we are richer because of the gifts that he has shared with us. We thank you. We bless him as he goes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We have a couple of different uh, folks coming up to read scripture. It's marked differently in your worship guide. Uh, first, you'll hear the scriptures in English, but then you'll also hear it in another language. So we want to invite our scripture readers to come up uh, to, to provide the scripture for us in a little bit different way this morning. Jeremiah 32, the Lord of heavenly forces, the God of Israel, proclaims, take these documents and seal thee for purchase along with the unsealed ones and put them into a clay container so that it will last a long time. The Lord of heavenly forces, the God of Israel, proclaims, houses, fields, and vineyards will again be brought in this land. قادر متعال خدای اسرائیل چنین می‌فرماید این قباله مبعون شده و رونوشت آن را بگیر و در یک روزه بگذار تا سالها محفوظ بماند این اسناد در آینده ارزش خواهند داشت زیرا روزی خواهد رسید که هر کس بار دیگر صاحب املاک خود خواهد گردید خانه ها تاکستان ها و مزرعه ها خرید و فروش خواهند حال ببینیم ایمان چیست ایمان یعنی اطمینان داشتن به این که آنچه امیدواریم واقع خواهد شد ایمان یعنی یقین داشتن به آنچه اعتقاد داریم هرچند قادر به دیدنش نباشیم
invite you to pray with me. God, there is much to be thankful for this morning. Community of fellowship, music to stir and encourage our hearts. The blessing of being able to send someone with heavy hearts, but with a whole lot of hope that you're still at work. We ask this morning that you would continue to guide us into courageous discipleship, whatever that might look like for each of us, for our church in this coming week. Challenge us where we need to be challenged. Encourage us where we need to be encouraged. And open our eyes and our ears to what you have for each of us this morning. In Christ's name. So, for whatever reason, uh, yesterday I found myself browsing some old Facebook photos from college, <laughs> which, you know, can be fun, can be a little dangerous sometimes, um, mostly because it reminds you how trim and fit you used to be, <laughs> how simple life was, so on and so on. But I find that it's good to reminisce from time to time, just go back and browse old memories, kind of remember. And I rediscovered a few photos from my junior year of college. It was about a year and a half after Hurricane Katrina. And my church that I was a part of at the time organized some mission trips to aid in, you know, the rebuilding efforts, cleanup, which of course, as you know, is still happening, you know, years later. Before I ever even had a hunch that I would move to Louisiana, I found myself in New Orleans for the first time in January 2007, and then again in March, helping to clean up flooded homes, rebuild what we could, and try to find ways to give some hope to those who desperately needed it. And during one trip, we worked with an organization called the St. Bernard Project. Many of you may be familiar with them. It's a nonprofit organization run by a woman named Liz McCartney, who uh, the next year, 2008, ended up being named a CNN Hero of the Year for her work there in St. Bernard Parish. I think they're still around in some form. I, I read that they had done some work uh, after Hurricane Ida just a few years ago. Uh, they might be under a different name now, but. During the other trip, though, to New Orleans, we were also in St. Bernard Parish, working at Camp Hope was an old elementary school that had been turned into a volunteer camp for relief workers. This time it was a little bit less glamorous. Our group was tasked with cleaning and maintaining the volunteer camp for those that were being sent out into the community. The camp had no running water at that point. Uh, and if you know anything about uh, toilets and how that works without <laughs> running water. You might have a picture of what we had to deal with, but I remember some conversations though uh, with friends of mine. It might have been during the trip or before we were on our way, I can't really remember, but there were a lot of people asking, why stay? Why would someone continue to live in a place that continued to be pummeled year after year by these enormous storms. Some people felt that maybe it was irresponsible or naive uh, for someone to continue living in such a place. Now, of course, you know the answer better than I do. Though I've been able to learn this a little bit more deeply as I've lived here, people stay because it's home. To leave behind your family, your friends, your community, <coughs> Everything that gives you hope would be worse than facing the aftermath of the storm. And I can't speak too much about this as a non-native Louisianan. And I'm certainly not advocating for putting yourself in harm's way. But there is a hope that seems to permeate through communities that have faced a devastation like that and lived to tell the story. 
And the question we're asking this morning in this series on the building blocks of our faith is why hope? Why hope? Now the cynical among us would point to all the death and the destruction and the violence and chaos and poverty and anything else we could name and they might say, what's the point? It seems the odds are stacked against us. But I'd like to look at a story briefly this morning from the book of Jeremiah, which gives us an image, I think, of what hope looks like. Now, as I'm reading through this, and I'm mostly uh, speaking to Abigail right now, I'm going to pause along the way, just a heads up. <laughs> Hear this from uh, verse 1, chapter 32. Jeremiah received the Lord's word in the tenth year of Judah's king, Zedekiah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's rule. Now, before we go any further, <laughs> context is everything here. And you need to know that the 10th year of the reign of Judah's king, Zedekiah, was about the year 588 BCE. And if you know anything about the history of this time and place, you know that in about 587 or 586, Nebuchadnezzar's empire completely forced Jeremiah's people out of Jerusalem and utterly destroyed their temple. It was one of the most infamous events in the history of the Jewish people. And everything seemed lost. So continuing on in verse 2, at that time, the army of the Babylonian king had surrounded Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined to the prison quarters in the palace of Judah's king. Pausing again. Pay attention here. Note that Jeremiah was imprisoned by his own king, not Nebuchadnezzar, as you might expect if you were breezing through the passage. And this is because Jeremiah, who is known as the weeping prophet, it was a bit depressing at times. <laughs> he was telling the truth about their impending destruction. And the king, I guess, had had enough of it. As we skip over a couple of verses to verse 6, and we see something profoundly unexpected. Jeremiah said, The, the Lord's word came to me. Your cousin Hanamel, Shalom's son, is on his way to see you. And when he arrives, he will tell you, Buy my field in Anathoth, for by law you are next in line to purchase it. And just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel showed up at the prison quarters and told me, Buy my field in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, for you are next in line, and have a family obligation to purchase it. Jeremiah says, then I was sure this was the Lord's doing. So I bought the field in Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out for him 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, had it witnessed, and weighed out the silver on the scales. Now bear with me a second. There's a lot of detail here that you don't need to remember, but it is important. And we'll come back to it in a minute. He says, then I took the deed of purchase, the sealed copy, with its terms and conditions, and the unsealed copy, and gave it to Baruch, Neriah's son, and Messiah's grandson, before my cousin Hanamel, and the witness named in the deed, as well as before all the Judeans who were present in the prison quarters. And I charged Baruch before all of them. The Lord of heavenly forces, the God of Israel, proclaims, take these documents, this sealed deed of purchase, along with the unsealed one, and put them into a clay container so they will last a long time. The Lord of heavenly forces, the God of Israel, proclaims, houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. Jeremiah is in prison the Babylonians are at their doorstep. All is about to be lost. And Jeremiah buys a field 
right in the path of the coming destruction. Hurricane Katrina is coming tomorrow. And the crazy guy down the street buys a plot of land in the Lower Ninth Ward. <laughs> it's the worst investment ever. A terrible decision. Unbelievably naive and misguided. Unless, unless we have our eyes peeled for something different. Namely, hope. There's a man named Dr. Chan Hellman, who's a professor of psychology and the director of the Hope Research Center at the University of Oklahoma. And he's spent most of his career trying to understand the impact of hope on human well-being. He talks openly about his own story as he experienced homelessness for much of his teenage years, struggling to get by and to complete high school due to profound trauma. He and his team have spent a lot of time studying the nature of hope, what hope is, and how it helps people navigate difficult and traumatic situations. And he tells the story of an interaction he had early in his career with a man who was homeless. And as he listened to the man, he did what any good psychologist would do. He listened for signs of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. And what he heard from this man, though, was a future-oriented mindset as he talked about where he wanted to be in his life, what he hoped to accomplish, and how he was taking steps to move in a better direction. Now, Dr. Hellman acknowledges that this isn't easy for most people. Sometimes it's impossible. Life circumstances can make it seem impossible to have hope. But what they found in their research is that when hope is present, people tend to do much better. Kind of makes sense. And they've come up with a working definition of hope, which is this. Hope is the belief that the future will be better and, and this is the important part, and you have the power to make it so. Hope is based on three main ideas, they said. Desirable goals, pathways to goal attainment, and agency or willpower to pursue those pathways. And the main point that Dr. Hellman wants people to understand is that hope is active. It requires action. Hope isn't wishful, wishful thinking or wishing, just passively sitting back and waiting for something good to happen. It's very different, even, from spiritual bypassing, the tendency to use spiritual explanations as a defense mechanism to avoid acknowledging pain or struggle. That way of thinking might cause someone to say, don't worry about your problems. They don't matter. They're not really there. Hope is different. Hope doesn't avoid pain. But rather, it looks pain right in the face, defiant. And it says, yes, this hurts, but you won't win. Mm. There's a better future ahead. Mm. And I'm going to choose to act as if that were so. Mm. So back to the passage. The Babylonians were right at their doorstep. In fact, they had already probably experienced months of pain at the hands of their oppressors. And yet, Jeremiah buys a field. He says, you might win the battle, but you won't win the war. By the way, you suffered with me through several verses of real estate transaction detail. <laughs> Quite boring. But it's actually a really important part of the passage. 
and here's why. Those procedures for who gets to buy the land and how was written in their law way back in Leviticus. The law that they followed in covenant with God and the law that they had abandoned in some sense at this point in their history. And so as their temple, the place they encounter God and work out this covenant with God, as it's about to be destroyed, to lean back on that law, on that relationship, was an act of defiant hope, as if to say, this will still matter. Hope is that active posture, not wishful thinking, but choosing to take a risk, trusting that your spirit-filled gut is onto something. True hope is defiant. And if you've experienced this in your life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So what does this mean for us this morning? We who call ourselves followers of Jesus, the one who died but didn't stay dead, the one who shows us that there's always life to be found, even in death. We who follow him embrace the call to be a people who have the long view in mind, who have vision for a hopeful future, a vision for the kingdom of God that Jesus talked about. You've heard the Dr. King quote countless times. He says the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. It takes time. That doesn't make it any less true. Even though it may not look like it sometimes, we believe that God is making things better, making things right, and that the Spirit is at work to empower those who feel powerless, to give hope to people who feel hopeless, and that we get to be a part of that. It's why something, for example, like a small gift card to a teacher at Highland Elementary isn't an insignificant gesture, but rather a way of saying, we see you and what you do matters. And maybe that small gesture gives that teacher hope to press through a challenging day, having ripple effects through her class of children as they feel loved and cared for and educated. Dr. Hellman, the psychologist I mentioned earlier, finds in his research that hope begets hope, as he says. That small hope-filled actions can multiply exponentially as we help each other catch a vision for what the future can be. I think it's easy for many of us to begin to feel cynical or despairing when we see all the problems of the world and we feel like we can't fix them all. I'll let you in on a little secret. You can't. But that's not the point. You're probably familiar with the great American poet Wendell Berry. He wrote a poem entitled February 2nd, 1968. Three days into the Tet Offensive, one of the most devastating phases of the Vietnam War, in a year that saw the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy. Dark, dark time. Three-line poem. This is what he writes. In the dark of the moon, in flying snow, in the dead of winter, war spreading, families dying, the world in danger. I walk the rocky hillside, sewing clover. 
So why hope? Because our faith is a hope-filled faith, which says that the world, as it is now, is not how it will always be. Our faith says that God is up to something, and God calls us to be a part of it. May we choose to do so. Amen. Our time of response this morning, we'll be sharing the table together around communion. As we think, as we think of those in our lives, those around us in the world who may need hope desperately. Maybe you're in a place this morning where you need some hope, where you're questioning a lot. We remember this meal that Jesus shared with his disciples, where on one of the darkest nights of his life, he was able to look ahead and see what God was doing. As they shared this meal, it's meal of bread and wine and maybe some other things too. Jesus took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. It will sustain you. It will give you life. So take and eat. Likewise, he took the cup. And he said to his disciples, this cup represents a new covenant in my blood. A new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Whatever you have done, whatever shame or guilt you feel, can be gone. He said, drink in remembrance of me. As often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim this death and resurrection until the Lord comes. you to stand as you were able and go in singing 613 the servant song. <laughs> Thank you. 
nice long list of announcements for you and opportunities for engagement, which is a good thing. That means there's a lot that's going on right now in the life of this church. But it is a bit of a list, so bear with me as I try to remember everything I'm saying. Uh, a quick reminder that uh, there's no retirees luncheon this month. All your other things are happening, dinner and out in town, but there's not a luncheon for this month. Next Sunday is Blessing Up the Backpacks here during worship. So we invite all of our school age children, um, little ones, all the way up to really big ones, right? Much older ones to bring their backpacks and come and be recognized as the school year begins. Soccer Academy, Fall Soccer Academy, is open for registration right now. I encourage you, uh, if you know anyone that has little ones and uh, of that age range that want to participate, go ahead and sign up. And as I said a few weeks ago, we will be wanting volunteers, lots and lots of volunteers. So you may also want to pop in and check out those dates and see when you might feel, feel led to come and help for one hour on a Saturday. Uh, speaking of volunteering, Family Tree Cafe, which is what this space is transformed into every single week for members of our community to come, let their kids play in some air conditioning, maybe get some work done, have a little bit of coffee, uh, operates pretty much by our volunteers. Showing up, uh, we have 9 to 12, Monday through Thursday, Family Tree Cafe is open. I need people here on Tuesdays is the one day and all of the foreseeable future. I don't really have anyone that's able to come. If you feel like you want to come and do whatever you want to do from 9 to 12, there's a, you can talk to those who've done it uh, in the past. You just sort of set up and you're a person who's here if anyone needs anything. Uh, 9 to 12, Tuesdays in particular, if you have time and you would like to come help with that, please see me. On August 18th, uh, some of you got an email about this, uh, but if you did it and you think you need more information, please let me or John or Tanya or Eric know. Uh, August 18th, we're looking really uh, closely at our young adults and our ministries involved with young adults. So we're going to be having a little luncheon with uh, all who would be considered young adults. If you think you need to be part of that, let us know. Uh, if you did not get the email this past week with a lovely video from John and Tanya, let them know. Uh, we, we are glad to begin looking at this in a, a closer light. Right. Last but not least, this space, like I said, becomes Family Tree Cafe during the week. And then on Sunday mornings, uh, it's put back into worship for us. We could use a couple volunteers to help Set that up and maybe even to break it down here in just a few minutes uh, if you are interested in helping with that please see ken tipton or one of us uh, and this is my friendly reminder if you could help stack the chairs and throw away your little uh communion element uh, holders and all of those things in just a moment that would be most helpful <sighs> <laughs> am i forgetting anything <coughs> all right i'm sure there's more but it, Check that back at the bulletin. All right. I should stand for benediction. And now, as we go forth from this space, may the love and grace we have experienced here compel us to draw others into God's beloved community. And we think criti critically, live creatively, and love continually as we walk with Jesus this week. Amen. Amen. Amen.
There we go. 